This is a podcast from The Bugle. The horses chafe at their bits, the jockeys' bits chafe at the saddle, the pre-race bit is happening. In the stands, men in uncomfortable suits and women in unsuitable heels grip their paper tickets, waiting for the race to begin. Photojournalists keep an eye on the clock, waiting for a drink to make those clothing and shoe heel choices photogenically perilous. Outside the stadium, in more sensible shoes and clothes, protesters protest the cruelty of the sport. An official raises the gun. But the hush that falls over the crowd is not just of anticipation. A shadow obscures the sun. Is it a zeppelin? Is it a cloud? No, it's the gargle. This is the gargle. Welcome to the gargle, the sonic glossy magazine to the Bugle's audio newspaper for a visual world. I'm your host, Alice Fraser, and your guest editors for this week's edition of the magazine are Jos Norris. Welcome back. Hello. Thanks for having me. Uh, It's a great pleasure. And Anya Mariano, welcome. Hiya. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, again, I'm excited to have you on the show. Uh, before we all put our hands on each other's shoulders and engage in the awkward massage that is this week's top stories, let's have a look at the front cover of this week's magazine. The front cover this week is a French bedbug smoking a Gaulois cigarette and refusing to bite a German tourist because it's not locally sourced. And uh, the satirical cartoon this week is Nobel Prize winner Catalin Carrico posing provocatively with a number of rejection letters from prominent scientific journals and Penn University tenure track. Uh, have you been following either of those two stories, Jaws? Uh, I don't know anything about either of them, but I love the bed bug one. That's a hell of an image. I've never empathised with a bed bug before, but I feel like you gave it a, a real kind of, um, I feel like I know him now. <laughs> What did he do? He wouldn't eat a German. <laughs> the, uh, no, the, the, there's a, a massive rash of bed bugs um, in Paris at the moment. Right. Okay. But I assume if they're French bed bugs, I mean, the, the joke of the bit was Is that, that he's, French bed bugs he's wouldn't snob. bite German tourists because they're racists. Got it. Got it. Now I know. <laughs> you know, they make you insane, bed bugs. They like make you um, hallucinate <laughs> and think that uh, you like you see things. Apparently, really. Yeah, there was something. So we had a terrible bed bug infestation in our flat once, and only I think one of one of my flatmates discovered it first. But it was also making her hallucinate mad shit. So Whoa. we didn't believe her. We were like, "No, there's no bed bugs," because she was also saying like, "And why is this like headless man in the flat?" I mean, and now now I say it all out loud. This sounds crazy, and I can't remember whether this actually <laughs> happened. But I'm pretty Maybe certain. You were hallucinating. That, yeah, it might just be the bed bugs might. talking. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've got them now. I've been bitten by bed bugs uh, in Wales. This is oh. I have a, I have a beef with I have a beef with Swansea, um, because I got bitten by bed bugs in Swansea. But I didn't hallucinate. At least I don't remember hallucinating. Okay, but I do I'm remember shit. is I went down and I told the lady at reception, and they said they'd pay for dry cleaning and all that sort of thing. And then I went to a breakfast place uh, in Swansea, and they said they had avocado and eggs. And I thought, you know, as a Sydney girl from Australia, that this will soothe my hideous bed bug distorted form and uh they what they did was they <laughs> they halved the avocado they put the egg in the hole and they microwaved it oh, what oh my god <laughs> no <laughs> wow. so strange <laughs> it might be the worst thing anyone's ever offered me to eat so i feel uh i feel like maybe swansea has some work to do to get back into my good books mm-hmm. Our top story today is Swamp Romp News, and this is the news of a crocodile sex frenzy that was triggered by helicopters flying low in Queensland. Uh, Anya, you've had a wrestle with a crocodile before. Can you unpack this story for us? I'm almost always wrestling with crocodiles, it feels like. Um, I can't get away from them. Well, the main thing that struck me about this story, which um, is like the the article that kind of talks about it is written in such an intense yeah. way it's like reading paradise lost which i ha- haven't read but i imagine it's like reading paradise lost it's the the sort of like um the evocative writing it took me about 3 reads to actually understand what has happened and now that i've read it like 3 times it, it's like the person has just discovered a thesaurus basically the crocodiles get horny because they hear helicopters and they they don't really know why it does that but it's sort of like the crocodile equivalent of um when jason derulo comes on in the club (laughs) again i imagine people get excited when jason derulo comes on in the club 
Yes, I go into a sex frenzy. Oh, I don't know from that bit in Cats where he shouts milk and then he shouts no more milk. So I didn't yes, realise it, it happened was at the cinema as well. <laughs> But good for them, I think. Like, they, they get turned on by the thunderstorms, they get turned on by the helicopters. Like, that's a nice life. Yeah. yeah it's easy I mean, for them. So many people are afraid of thunderstorms. So many people are afraid of helicopters. Uh, and, you know, as they say, the line between fear and horniness is narrow indeed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it's funny because I think, like, I can imagine thunderstorms being an aphrodisiac for humans in the sense of like maybe it means you like stay in and it's like a bit cozy and you're warm and outside is cold but like they're not staying in anywhere they're already in the water (laughs) like it's not cozy for them (laughs) are you suggesting that crocodiles spend their whole time just being like oh i'm so wet yeah (laughs) why don't we live in houses we're in yeah they're like oh i wish i had a duvet uh jaws I'm quite grateful to this story because I think it's been quite healing for me because I hate um, crocodiles. I I sort of, they're kind of my favorite animal, but I'm mortally afraid of them. And whenever I see one, I get, I get like a real chill. So now, you know, when you scroll through like Instagram or whatever, and it gives you random content, like short reels and stuff, Mm. it only gives me videos of crocodiles now because whenever one comes up, (laughs) I like freeze and have a real like, oh shit, oh shit instinct in my, in my guts. Uh, and Instagram thinks that that means I love it because I always stop on them. So now it just gives me crocodile after crocodile. And I they re- I think I'm going to die. I, I, I think that that's how I'm going to die. I think they've, they've like taken on this mythic kind of um, uh, role for me. But then the more I learn about them, the more I've started to think of them as like quite pathetic in a way. Because first there was that thing about, you know, you can like uh, hold their mouth shut with your hand and then they can't open their mouth. Oh. Like if you put a rubber band on it, then they can't open it because they're actually quite weak. And now I find out that if you if they hear a helicopter, then they're reduced to a kind of like gibbering, horny, wretched state. And I find that now I just I just find them quite <laughs> funny now because I used to think they were like the Terminator. They kind of mm. felt like the Terminator to me. And then I imagine the Terminator like humping your leg every time it hears a helicopter or whatever and I'm like yeah that's not that's not scary anymore so I think they've turned them into these quite foolish characters I now think that they're buffoons crocodiles yes their down bite is very strong but their opening bite is yes, very yes that's weak. it so yeah it's, they it's, can't like open like, their mouth yeah it's like if the terminator was still the terminator but if you just put your finger on his forehead he couldn't keep walking forwards <laughs> yeah he can't lift his arm <laughs> he can punch you really hard but he can't get it up there in the first place <laughs> um, so I think I've this story's done a lot of personal growth for me. I feel slightly less um, horrified by them, and maybe I'll even befriend one now. I won't try to get off with it or anything, even though like I know how. I'm, I'll draw the line there, <laughs> but I will, you know, maybe I'll hang out with one for a coffee. Your ad section now, because you can't be what you can't buy. And this section of the podcast is brought to you by Washable Markers just very slightly less washable than you'd like them to be. But if you do have a washable marker disaster on your hands or legs or feet or stomach or walls or floor or toddler, try resolving it with a uh, a small towel and half a glass of water. And a new novel is out by self-published romance maven and online bestseller, Dancy Lagarde. The Heights of Longing is a standalone in Lagarde's Those Magnificent Men series of standalone novels about Victorian aerialists with an industrial revolution twist. Jack Haggerty is the king of the sky, a well-known exhibition balloonist. He's got room in his heart only for his balloon and the clouds. Sangeetha is the illegitimate daughter of a wealthy East India Company partner sent to London to earn her way running the books of her father's silk warehouse. He's got a head for heights and muscular thighs. She's got a head for business and a bottom for adventure. (laughs) (laughs) When Jack comes in to finger her silks, it's lust at first sight. But the course of true love never did have a hitch-free launch, with Jack pursued by a newspaper journalist seeking a sensational headline, sky-high sabotage, and thrill-seeking women dazzled by his celebrity and massive thighs. Meanwhile, Sangeetha's hand in marriage is ruthlessly bartered for by a rival cloth house bourish, yet a lordly owner's vile Viscount son, who offers both her father's approval and a way to enter, however conditionally, the highest echelons of British society. When a lustful balloon fangirl's tangled scheme goes awry, Sangeetha finds herself literally caught up in a runaway hot air balloon incident with a hysterical teen, an outraged Viscount, and the one man she knows she shouldn't let ruffle her bustle. 
<laughs> Compromised midair, crash landing in a village, abandoned by her horrible fiance with Jack injured in the groin and feverish from chivalrously giving her his coat midair. She must nurse this wounded yet muscular aerialist back to health in a rustic inn, soothe his fevered groin and figured out how to save her father's business prospects. But how? Find out in the Heights of Longing, available at altitude and up the back of all respectable bustles. I've got to read that. Yeah. Sounds exactly my kind of thing. Well, you can read it in uh, the Dancy Lagarde Reader, which is available for <laughs> uh, on presale now at unbound.com. Japanese cloud news now, and this is the news that Japanese scientists have discovered uh, that not only do clouds sometimes look like fluffy pieces of marshmallow, uh, also they are full of microplastics, uh, which is a terrible tragedy. Uh, Jaws, you've tried to drink a cloud before. Can you unpack this story for us? All the time. It went very badly. There's a lot of liquid in a cloud, it turns out, more than you can realistically stomach. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I initially just found this story quite sad. Uh, mm. It made me think of, you know, it's yet more evidence that our consumerist society has kind of destroyed the planet as we as we know it. And then I was struggling to kind of get past that. But then I remembered the Barbie movie and I thought, actually, what if the fact that there is plastic in the clouds isn't evidence of how much we've kind of destroyed the environment, but is a, a scrap of evidence for the fact that maybe we ourselves are dolls <laughs> living in some kind of simulacrum of, of of the real universe and we're being played with by children somewhere out there and that might actually be some sort of explainer for the the sort of the random cruelty of the mm. universe perhaps uh so that cheered me up a bit and then actually the the thing i liked most about this story was there was a there's a bit where it says that um previously scientists have found microplastics in the snows on top of mountains uh and this thing about the clouds finally explains how it got there, because previously they were thinking, how did how did the plastic get to the? And to me, I feel like surely the turtles it, can't get that high up. <laughs> this, this is the thing. I was kind of imagine like what was the working theory before they found out it was clouds? Because you'd think if it was in the snow on top of mountains, you'd go, oh, will have will have come down from the clouds. But maybe the previous <laughs> theory was like there was some yeti that was like raiding the bins of the cities <laughs> and coming down into the foot and then carrying it to the top of the mountain. And now finally they can go, oh, great, we can we can debunk the Yeti theory officially. It's in clouds. <laughs> yeah, or just a lot of a lot of uh, makeup influencers going to the top of mountains yeah. to use their <laughs> exfoliating microbeads. It might be like Shawshank Redemption, you know, when he digs that tunnel and then he has to, like, shake it out into the yard in, in his trousers. Maybe there's people acquiring <laughs> too many microplastics and then they go to the top of the mountain and kind of shake it out and they go, hopefully nobody will notice all these microplastics I'm dumping up here. But... They've been rumbled. And I don't know why they're gathering so much of it anyway. I don't know what they're up to. Sounds I mad. Mean, the question about what scientists are up to is a big question for our times, yeah. I feel. Yeah, yeah. Anya, have you ever looked at the sky and thought, that looks like particularly plasticky cloud? Yeah, well, I guess like clouds, they don't like seem super real anywhere. Like, I think in your life, you already go through like one big sort of sad realization as a child when you find out that they're not fluffy and you can't like touch them or sit on them so it's like everyone has already experienced like one major betrayal by clouds um so i think this is it's, it's just another one to add to the list so this one is our fault and i had the same experience of jo as jaws like i did find it quite sad to read and also all the like suggested articles were like air pollution is going to kill everyone in like five minutes sort of thing along the side and i was like Hmm. All fish are dead. That was yeah. like one of <laughs> all, all fish are dead. <laughs> Indonesia's president has a cough. Um, and <laughs> But the one thing that stuck out to me, and I know this isn't going to reflect well on me, but in one of the sentences, it's, it, it's describing the amount and it says it ranged in size from 7.1 to 94.6 micrometers. And I didn't know about micrometers. Yeah, I've I don't. I, I assume that meant millimetres. Yeah, metres, centimetres, millimetres. Is it micrometres below that? Wow. Well, See, that's, that's, that's good news. <laughs> that's surely good too news. small to, to bother caring about. <laughs> to worry about, yeah. I just remember when I was younger, like, millimetres, the whole thing with millimetres is like, these guys are pretty small. And to, <laughs> to find out that there's a new one... <laughs> That's blown my mind. And I know that's not the takeaway from the article, but it's it's definitely it's definitely up there for me. 
the takeaway from the article is whatever you want it to be. The takeaway from the article for me is that maybe we're coming full circle on that betrayal uh, about clouds not being touchable or sittable on. Maybe if we get enough microplastics into the clouds, yeah. they yeah, will be. make them tangible and live out our dreams. Well, I'm currently under the flight path uh, on the way to the airport here in, in Bologna in Italy where I'm staying, and I just Ooh. like to imagine all the planes sort of bouncing softly from one cloud to another. <laughs> And now it's time for your reviews. As you know, each week we ask our guest editors to bring in something to review out of five stars. Jaws, what have you brought in for us this week? So I've decided to review my experience of having to do physio exercises on my shoulder now uh, because I, I have quite bad posture when I sit at my desk. So my shoulder hurts quite a lot now. So I now have to do these physio exercises. Um, and what I've worked out is they've told me that I have to do about half an hour of exercises roughly every two days in order to kind of get it back to, to full strength. And nobody at the physio practice has actually told me you're going to have to do this for the rest of your life. But they have sort of strongly implied that if I ever stop doing them and then it starts hurting again, then I'm not allowed to complain to them about it because they've told me what I should be getting on with. So I did some maths and I've worked out like I, ideally I'd like to live for like another 60 years um, ish. And then I'd like to die uh, very quickly in a kind of a, a, an exciting hang gliding accident when I'm 94. <laughs> that's, that's how I want to go out. I fear it's going to be a crocodile sooner than that, but I'd like it to be a hang gliding thing in my 90s. Um, so if that works out and I have to spend 30 minutes every two days doing these exercises, I have to commit to spending uh, 5,475 hours of my life, which is 228 days, uh, just stretching my shoulder. And that's roughly enough time to watch the full Lord of the Rings trilogy 608 times. Uh, and I'm I'm quite bored of these exercises now. Like I'm already <laughs> bored of them. Um, and they can't even guarantee that it will definitely make my shoulder better. But what they have said is I'm not allowed to complain about it unless I do it. So it sort of feels like I have to commit to 228 days of boredom just to preserve my right to, to moan about my shoulder <laughs> in the future, which feels like just a very negative thought trap. It feels like I'm doing this thing I don't like in order to preserve the, the negative experience of complaining. And it feels like maybe I'm better off doing none of it and just uh, just getting on with my life. So I, I feel like they've put in me in constant a difficult... shoulder pain. Yeah, that's that's the flip side. But unable to comment on it, like Cassandra or something. Did she have a bad shoulder? I think she had a bad shoulder. She foresaw a bad shoulder, but the physios yeah, wouldn't believe would her. So. <laughs> um, so yeah, I I feel like um, I, I I'm, I'm not a fan. I don't like it, but I'm allowed to not like it because I'm doing the exercises. So at the moment, I still have the right to give it one out of five. One out of five <laughs> stars uh, for shoulder physio and the attendant complexities. Um, Anya, what have you brought in for us this week? I'm reviewing flowers, um, kind of as a general <laughs> uh, concept, I guess. Um, because I got some flowers um, for myself from, for my flat the other week because I was like a bit sad, had a bit of a bad week and I really didn't like being being in the flat. And so I, I thought getting some flowers, like putting some life around around the house will make it feel really nice. Um, and it worked really well. I got like these amazing like big orange flowers and like some blue ones as well. And I was like, this is so nice. When I was buying them, I felt like I was at the start of like a rom-com or something there's something about buying flowers where you're like this is like such a waste of money um there is no way that anyone normal in real life would do this so it feels like inherently sort of cinematic <laughs> to do it um and yeah they made like such a difference every day we had we had some like friends over and everyone was like oh the flowers are so nice and I was like yeah the flowers are really nice um and then that was on a Sunday and then by the Wednesday they kind of started to rot and started to wilt um, and by like Thursday evening they were pretty much dead and I haven't cleaned them up yet because I spent I spent like 11 pounds on them so I think they should <laughs> last for longer um, so they're still up so I'm kind of living in like a graveyard of rotting flowers at the moment um, and they make the room look like pretty emo um because it's just like these <laughs> wilted flowers with like all their petals kind of like scattered on the tables around them um and yeah it kind of makes the room look worse than it did before so they've kind of <laughs> slid down the scale initially they were at a five star for me but I have to say I will give them four stars 
Um, but I would give them five if they were immortal. But I don't like plastic <laughs> flowers, so like the, that won't that would that won't help. I've got some plastic flowers and they don't do the trick. So it's it's another case of the sadness of um, end of life. <laughs> the sadness of end of life. Four stars. <laughs> Now it's time for your tech news, and this is the news that uh, Meta, ex-Facebook, uh, is using AI of celebrities as chatbots to help you play games in order to lure people back into the Metaverse. Uh, Anya Maliano, you spent a lot of time uh, on your phone. Can you unpack this story for us? Yeah, that's completely true. Um, <laughs> I, so I didn't, I didn't fully grasp exactly what this meant, but like what it means by having celebrities play them because I'm not sure I fully understand AI and I don't really engage with it. But the thing that struck me was that Mark, first name terms, says at one point he says, uh, like, we just want to do this because like, actually, most people have not even been able to experience AI. And it's like, there's plastic in the clouds like we don't we don't need to worry about, like it's fine it's yeah. fine if people aren't experiencing ai um and i just think it sounds like a massive waste of time and money and a completely stupid thing to do um that being said if they are casting my agent is available to be contacted <laughs> uh jaws my favorite bit of this story was there was a detail about a meta employee who tested like he did a, a beta test of one of these ai bots and he said that he found the ai bot to be rude and said <laughs> that he didn't understand its personality which i think is such a funny <laughs> like comment to make about it because it it feels to me like that points out their like total failure to make a convincing human consciousness because you would never say i don't understand your personality <laughs> to <laughs> to a person there's like you might think that somebody has a weird personality or you might not like someone's personality or you might make a snap judgment about somebody's personality based on like first impressions and then later find out you were wrong and they're slightly different to what you thought. But I don't think you would ever meet somebody and then say, I don't understand your personality. <laughs> so it suggests that whatever this AI bot was doing was just like wildly inconsistent. And the tone, mm. I was trying to work out what it could have been doing. And the, all I could get in my head was the idea that maybe it starts as a very kind of authoritarian teacher figure that's quite militaristic and goes like hard work and perseverance will will get us through or something and then it tears its clothes off and rolls itself in flour and makes bird noises or something and then maybe this meta employee will be like yeah i don't understand the personality of this of this guy uh, but i thought that was such a telling comment um and i also thought it was weird that because mostly you look at the list of celebs that zuckerberg has got involved and they're all that they're quite clearly geared at young people. It's like, it's people I've never heard of. It's Kendall Jenner, uh, Naomi Osaka. Uh, I'm sure they're all brilliant, but I think they're all they're all people that have passed me by. But then Snoop Dogg's in there. And I was thinking, <laughs> how is Snoop Dogg still like of eternal relevance to young people? What's he done to keep himself so <laughs> yeah. in the public eye? I was, he's like a cockroach. And I mean that in the best way. He's just operating in slow motion. So it hasn't caught up to him yet. <laughs> 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 that he's no longer relevant so he remains yeah. eternally relevant because he's in a kind of a chill uh a chill slow motion state i think one of the really interesting things about uh this is that they are they are making the celebrity ais play characters so it's mm. not just that you're talking oh. to snoop dog snoop dog or the ai of snoop dog is playing a dungeon master who will assist you to play adventure games so it's 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 the the premise is that the ai is somehow inherently Snoop Dogg, but is performing as a dungeon master. And I feel like this is the cleverest way to overcome the reality that these will be completely incoherent characters. <laughs> it's, it's, it'll, it'll just, it's, whatever inconsistencies there are lie in the chasm between Snoop Dogg and dungeon master, not in our technology. <laughs> um, and I think that's very clever. I, I mean, it, it is really, um, for me, it has really redeemed the meta landscape from their failure to provide legs. They don't provide legs. Oh, it t I mean, they, they launched legs with great fanfare at, at one point and they weren't very good. <laughs> Did they? Oh, I missed that. <laughs> yeah, which is, I mean, they, they failed with the, with the failure to provide legs and then the big uh, hullabaloo about providing legs later on in the game. I think they revealed a big problem in the meta development process, which is that 
all good technology online is uh, either sourced from the military or pornography and there is no pornographic landscape that would fail to provide people with a bottom half there was one other thing with this which was because i was wondering about snoop dogg somehow managing to stay relevant and looked at what he's been doing this whole time i was trying to work out if he'd released any new music recently and it turns out he's still releasing music all the time he released uh six albums last year what uh, yeah and two of them are named after the metaverse and then it's called metaverse part one and metaverse part two or something and then i just found this quite sweet that they're just obviously really good friends him and zuckerberg <laughs> <laughs> Snoop Dogg's sort of name checking them on his albums and then Zuckerberg's going, oh, would you want to play a dungeon master in my shit game? <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> Bless him. I think my favourite part of this is that Zuckerberg's gotten ahead of all criticism by saying this isn't about answering queries, it's about entertainment. <laughs> yeah. Mm. That's what I say in my shows. <laughs> <laughs> judgmental children news now and this is the news uh, in ireland that a kids court has been established in order to punish people who are exceeding the speed limit outside school zones so basically if you exceed the speed limit and you break the law in this way you have the option of either going through the traditional court system and paying a fine or getting points docked off your license or <laughs> you can sign up to a kind of community initiative where you go in and are lectured by smug children who don't know how to drive <laughs> um, so uh jaws uh, you understand road rules can you unpack this story for us i just um I I found that all of the, there was an interesting thing in this story. Where it said that a certain number of motorists who've been offered this have turned it down. They've been told you can either pay a fine and have points on your license, or you can come and hang out with these kids and they'll talk to I you about speeding. I would rather be eaten by horny crocodiles yeah. than have to face four <laughs> I just children. Thought, like, how much have you got to hate kids to be given the option of like you have to spend money and potentially lose your license, or you can just hang out with some kids for a bit? And it will presumably maybe it'll be a bit embarrassing to be like judged by children, but also. I would imagine quite interesting and fun and like a mm. bit different. And yet there were some people who hate kids so much. They were like, no, I will pay you to avoid that experience. I don't want that. I'm completely on the opposite end of this spectrum from you, Jaws. Although I love Really? Children. What? You'd pay the money? I have been around some really judgmental children and they're appalling. <laughs> they're, they're impossible to come. They're impossible to deal with because they don't understand any complex motivations at all. Uh, and they're capable of, of sort of a great uh, moral rectitude in a way that is like deeply <laughs> cringy and embarrassing right. to the part of you that still thinks that you should believe in the way that they do. So you'd be sat there trying to explain to them why speeding is actually really good. <laughs> <laughs> I think I had, I just had a more fun vision of what it could be because I think if I ran it, what I would do is before the adult came in, I would get the kids, I would like cover them in fake blood and stuff and make them pretend to be <laughs> ghosts. So then when they come in, they all stand there like the kids in The Shining and they, they talk in unison and they're like, why didn't you slow down or whatever? I'd do it like that so that it becomes a kind of haunted house ghost train thing. And I think that would be just quite fun for the adult. Like a, like a horror movie. Yeah, you, adults <laughs> would start speeding just to get to go in and yeah. see it. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm just, I'm just going to run this quote past you, Jaws, and tell me if you still feel uh, that you would prefer to be in front of the children's court than to pay the fine uh, mm -hmm. slash get the points off your license. Pupil Emily Flanagan said it was a good experience which will help prevent speeding. I think the people that came before us as a court uh, didn't know they were speeding and now they, they know the consequences could lead to a child being killed on the road. <laughs> I think it sounds fun. <laughs> I think if I sat there and I had this serious little kid being like, I could have died, you know, I think I think I'd have a great time. <laughs> I'd play along and just be like, Oh yeah, well, I'm really sorry. God, what was I thinking? I'm an idiot. And then I'd just go home. It's not it's just nice to have a day out, isn't it? <laughs> I think maybe I'd I give more weight to the moral judgments of children than you do. You'd let it go off <laughs> yeah, you like I'd the water, right, water off a duck's say. back. <laughs> Anya? It's very different from my road safety education. Like all I remember was like some hedgehogs. Um, there was some sort of hedgehog thing and it was yeah. like maybe hedgehogs crossing the road. And yeah, they sang they... King of the Road. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think they wore high vis. Yeah, probably. <laughs> and that's so how it. would you feel? How would you feel if you run a red light and then you're put in front of a court of judgmental hedgehogs? <laughs> I'd actually be, I'd be really more emotionally affected than children because i'd be like not only um can hedgehogs judge 
<laughs> uh, but they're judging me specifically. And also all of a sudden I can drive. So it's like a huge turnaround <laughs> for my world. <laughs> uh, Joss, would you prefer hedgehogs or children? I'd or prefer horny hedgehogs, crocodiles. I think. Oh yeah, I don't wanna I don't wanna be brought before a panel of crocodiles. I think I'm still not ready <laughs> to to confront that fully. Hedgehogs, I'd be delighted. I met Mrs. Tiggywinkle once and it was <laughs> one of the best days of my life. She's enormous. <laughs> They like if you go to if you go to Beatrix Potter's house in the Lake District where she lives, there's like a Beatrix Potter museum and you can meet them all. Mrs. Tiggywinkle is massive. Just like so much bigger than I thought. It's like as tall as me. It was crazy. Because it wasn't that they made them all that size. Like Jeremy Fisher was like the size of a frog. But then Mrs. Tiggywinkle was as big as me. I was like, what? What's going on here? She's so big. Uh so I'd, I'd, I'd be happy to see her, her kin again. I mean, that brings us to the end of today's episode of The Gargle. Um, Anya, have you got anything to plug? Um, I am going on tour with my Edinburgh show. Um, it's a it's a stand-up show about the worst haircut I ever got in my life. Um, and the tour starts in January, ends in March. Um, going to all all classic places and then some random ones like pool. Um, so all the details are available on my website of that. Excellent. Look that up and go see Anya on tour. Jaws, have you got anything to plug? Uh, I don't have a huge amount to actually plug at the moment. I'm, I'm, I'm doing that. I'm in that bit where I'm working on lots of things that aren't currently finished. Uh, but there is a short film that's coming out in November, uh, which people can find on my website on josnorris.co.uk when that goes out. And uh, I guess the most recent big thing I did, I made a radio sitcom last year, which people can still find on BBC Sounds. And I'm working on hopefully more of that sort of thing uh, one of these days. I highly recommend it. The Dream Factory is excellent audio. Thank you to our roving reporters, Jared Watt, who sent in the crocodile sex story, which I recommend you read in full, ideally out loud. And uh, Matthew Collins, who sent in the kids' court story out of Ireland. If you would like to be a roving reporter, tweet us at Hello Garglers on the platform currently known as X. I'm Alice Fraser. You can find me online at patreon.com slash Alice Fraser. It's a one-stop shop for all of my stand-up specials, podcasts, and blogs, as well as my weekly writers' meetings. If you would like to work on whatever you're working on with me, uh, you can sign up at patreon.com slash Alice Fraser from a dollar a month. You get the access to all of those things. This is a Bugle podcast and Alice Fraser production. Your editor is Ped Hunter. Your executive producer is Chris Skinner. I'll talk to you again next week. You can listen to other programs from The Bugle, including The Bugle, Catharsis, Tiny Revolutions, Top Stories and The Gargle, wherever you find your podcasts. Take your time and play.